Ruddy Gore opened at the Savoy Theatre on January the 22nd, 1887. It had been preceded by The Mikado, which had achieved 672 performances in its initial run of almost two years, and which was, in the old theatrical phrase, a hard act to follow. Sullivan, however, had no immediate thoughts of following it with anything. He was soon to be travelling again, although this time it was to be further afield than the south of France. Family matters, more specifically the death of his sister-in-law, entailed nothing less than a journey to Los Angeles, which in those days involved a week's sailing to New York, followed by a nine-day, 3,000-mile train journey, taking him by way of Chicago, Denver and San Francisco, cities that would one day welcome seasons of Gilbert and Sullivan, performed by the Doily Cart Opera Company. While he was in Los Angeles, the Mikado opened in New York, conducted in his absence by Alfred Sellier. On his return journey, Sullivan met Cart in New York and was given a sight of Gilbert's latest plot. This was in October 1885. Gilbert had earlier suggested, yet again, that something could be made of the lozenge plot, but Sullivan was still firmly against it. Gilbert even suggested a plot based on the idea of Dr. Frankenstein and his monster, but nothing came of this. The agreement they had entered into with Cart in 1883 was to run for just over five years, that is, until March of 1888, and while the Mikado was an undoubted success, it would not last forever, and something else would eventually be required. By the new year, however, Sullivan not only had a new Savoy piece to think about, but another commission for the Leeds Triennial Festival. This was to be his cantata, The Golden Legend, produced at Leeds in October 1886. Apart from the Savoy operas, it was the first major work he had completed since The Martyr of Antioch, commissioned for the same Leeds festival six years previously in 1880 although he also wrote a short ode for the opening of the Colonial and Indian Exhibition, with words by Tennyson, which he conducted in the presence of Queen Victoria on May the 4th, 1886. The libretto of The Golden Legend was adapted from Longfellow's poem by Sullivan's friend, the critic Joseph Bennett, who also provided analytical notes. Describing the opening storm scene, Bennett says... The composer succeeds in obtaining a complex noise. While in describing the famous chorus, O Gladsome Light, he says, the composer here relies on the effect of a plain melody and diatonic harmonies. He will not be tempted from these by more ambitious suggestions. Sullivan's diary, referring to the storm scene with its complex noise, reads, Began scoring prologue, awful work, and later... At work again, scoring, awfully tedious and slow work. Whatever his feelings about its composition, the Golden Legend was a triumph, acclaimed by the press, the public and the musical establishment alike. As if echoing his own feelings, the musical world wrote, Sir Arthur Sullivan in The Golden Legend has surpassed the expectations of his most ardent admirers, and his success has pleased them, if possible, even more than himself. That success has indeed relieved them from a somewhat awkward position. It was difficult for them to claim a place in the foremost ranks of the English school for the author of The Pirates of Penzance, or even The Martyr of Antioch. But the case of the author of The Golden Legend rests on a very different basis. Even Gilbert wrote to him, saying... I congratulate you heartily on the success of the cantata, which appears from all accounts to be the biggest thing you've done. But Gilbert, his mind still on Savoy matters, continued. I have just finished the libretto. I don't expect you will want to turn to our work at once without any immediate rest, but if you do, I can go through the manuscript with you. The new libretto was in fact completed by November the 5th, which, as usual, left Sullivan very little time to compose. Characteristically, his diary for January 13th, 1887, reads, Writing all day. Finished whole score at 4 a.m. Ruddy Gore opened nine days later, on January 22nd. It was inevitable that nothing was going to match the success of the previous offering, but, for the first time, there were obvious signs of dissension in the audience. Rutland Barrington, who created Sir Despard, wrote in his memoirs that there were 
malcontents in the gallery shouting, take it away, give us back the Mikado, while the New York Times printed an even stronger version beginning, take off this rot, and all this in the presence of some very distinguished first-nighters, including the painters Hall and Millet, soon to paint portraits of Gilbert and Sullivan respectively, and Lord and Lady Randolph Churchill, the parents of the then 12-year-old Winston Spencer Churchill. The critics were kinder to Sullivan than to Gilbert, although the first act was generally well received. The music of the ghost scene in Act Two, when the ancestors stepped down from their frames, prompted many favourable comments, although some critics, and Gilbert too, thought that it was perhaps out of place in a comic opera. But the effectiveness of the orchestral writing here undoubtedly owes much to the work he had recently put into The Golden Legend, the complex noise of the storm scene, as Joseph Bennett had put it. The illustrated sporting and dramatic news referred to Sullivan's contribution as very good music too, but all the same presenting to that of the composer's preceding operas the strong family resemblance which is characteristic of the wicked baronets of Ruddigore themselves. This, however, was praise compared with the treatment meted out to the author. Mr Gilbert's dramatic fare is excellent of its kind, but its staple, as we have learned perforce, is strongly limited. The joint we have enjoyed hot from the spit may still be relished when presented cold with pickles, but when we find it persistently served up again, now spiced with curry, now hashed with onions, now minced into rissoles, and now heated with sauce, our appalled palate revolts at it. The mixed reception accorded to Ruddigore occasioned some immediate changes. Gilbert, Sullivan and Cart met the following day to consider what should be done. Even the title, which had been spelled with a Y, offended some people, and Gilbert characteristically suggested, among other things, that it might be changed to Kensington Gore, or Not So Good As The Mikado. The title, however, was retained, but with an I substituted for the Y. The changes that were made were mainly to the dialogue in Act Two, the principal change being that a second appearance of the ancestors was scrapped, the men's chorus reverting to their original appearance in Act One. The usual expedient of tightening up numbers by removing verses was applied to the duet for Robin and Old Adam at the beginning of Act Two, and the ballad for Rose, which comes shortly afterwards. The original song for Riven, which comes after the portraits have returned to their frames, was not the one we shall hear this afternoon, although the short recitative which precedes it is the same. The original text began, For thirty-five years I have been sober and wary. My favourite tipple came straight from a dairy. Gilbert, however, decided that it should be, as he put it, reset to an air that would admit of his singing it desperately. He also suggested that the recitative be taken out, but, in the event, that remained, while he furnished a new set of lyrics, beginning, Henceforth all the crimes that I find in the times, which Sullivan duly set to another tune. This was being performed by February 2nd, but, as so often, the music for the original has vanished. With these changes, the opera ran until November the 5th, 1887, achieving 288 performances, not even half the number achieved by the Mikado, although it was an advance on the 246 achieved by Princess Ida. By Savoy standards, Ruddigore might be counted a failure, but, as Gilbert said of the £7,000 profit he made from it, I could do with a few more such failures. Ruddigore was not revived during the author's lifetimes, in 1914, in a book entitled Gilbert, Sullivan and Doily Cart, it was thought useful to include a lengthy synopsis of the piece, including much of the dialogue and not a few of the lyrics. For, as the authors put it, among readers of this volume, there may be many who, never having witnessed the performance of Ruddigore, would like to hear what it was all about. This was published on the eve of the First World War, and it was a further six years before the opera was returned to its place in the series. During the Great War, the Doily Cart Opera Company toured throughout Great Britain, but it did not perform in London until the season of 1919-1920. By that time, the company was being managed by Richard Doily Cart's son, Rupert, 
who engaged as conductor for this season a promising young man called Geoffrey Toy. Francis Toy, the author of biographies of Rossini and Verdi, wrote of his brother. God had thought fit to endow him with a gift for music, for which exceptional is altogether too weak an adjective. There was never any question, so far as I know, of Geoffrey not adopting music as a career. In March 1914, Geoffrey Toy conducted the first performance of Vaughan Williams' A London Symphony. Part of Vaughan Williams' A London Symphony, which received its first performance in 1914 under Geoffrey Toy, who now, in 1919, took up the baton for a season of Gilbert and Sullivan, which included the first London revival of Princess Ida. His brother, Francis, who had once had singing lessons from the old Savoyard Richard Temple, wrote... In my considered opinion, Geoffrey was the best of all the conductors of Sullivan's music, not excluding, possibly, Sullivan himself. It was very largely his handling of the music that made the London season of Gilbert and Sullivan in the autumn of 1919 so successful. The following year, after an absence of some 33 years, Ruddigore was at last revived. Despite the changes that had been made after the opera's initial performances, it was thought necessary to make further changes, and these were entrusted to Geoffrey Toy. The changes included the removal of two numbers, the duet, The Battle's Roar is Over, in Act One, and Riven's song, Henceforth All the Crimes That I Find in the Times, in Act Two. It was also decided to replace the Act Two finale with a reprise of the last section of the Act One finale, and there were also numerous minor cuts, mainly in purely orchestral passages. One further result of these changes was that Geoffrey Toy had to write a new overture, as Sullivan's overture contains themes heard in The Battle's Roar is Over and the Act Two finale. Future editions of the libretto and the vocal score incorporated many of these changes, although the duet The Battle's Roar is Over was retained. However, it was in this greatly altered version that Ruddy Gore finally became known to future generations. In later years, the Doily Cart Company reinstated the duet The Battle's Roar is Over and the original Act Two finale. For this afternoon's performance, we have retained many of Geoffrey Toy's minor cuts, but have restored all four of the numbers which he altered or deleted. We have already heard the original overture and the duet The Battle's Roar is Over. In Act Two, we will hear the song for Riven, henceforth all the crimes that I find in the times, and the original finale. Geoffrey Toy also conducted the next London season of 1921-1922, which included Ruddigore. But he did not conduct the first performance of his revised version, as that was given during a provincial tour in Glasgow in December 1920. He conducted a third London season for Rupert Doyley Cart in 1924, and in the chorus that year was a young man called Leslie W. Booth, later to achieve fame as Webster Booth. Toy's connection with Gilbert and Sullivan was not yet ended, however. Fifteen years later, in 1939, he adapted, produced and conducted the film version of The Mikado, one of the first full-length features to be made in colour. But before that, in the mid-thirties, he composed a score for the Sadlerswells Ballet, the title of which must surely have reminded him of his connection with the haunted castle of Ruddigore. For this score, he produced what is perhaps his most original and best-remembered composition. Here is the wonderfully evocative waltz from The Haunted Ballroom. <laughs> 